have to go over here. Good morning, everybody. Hello, how are you doing? Um, we're going to, oh, hang on. There we go. Morning. There. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. I'm still getting used to all the little different buttons I have to push and everything to make this work. Um, my name's Alex, and today I'm going to be sharing my screen for you. Let me get that going. And um, then I'm going to, hey, Tolga came in. I knew he would be here. Just made it. Yeah, just barely. Okay, you should be seeing my Astro Imaging uh, channel screen with a big red background. Is that right, Tolga? Yes. Everybody? Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the Astro Imaging channel um, for June 23rd. I'm gonna draw your attention to a few things around here. And so I thought I'd use this screen to do that. The first thing I wanna show you over here is um, some upcoming screen. If you go back to this part of the website, okay? You guys are all down below, but if you go back to this part of the website and click on that, this page will come up and here it is showing bigger and you can see that we've got ray here tonight to talk about pem pro he's going to talk about a few things we'll get to that in a second carrie ann lecky hepburn is coming next week she's a meteorologist from up in canada and we met her at um NIAC, among other things uh, she takes really good photos of a lot of things um and has been awarded an apot congratulations she'll be here next week yeah alex you got an echo really good okay who's it from um and has been awarded turn off youtube behind you i'm still screen sharing aren't i Not for me. Okay. Is it off? Is yes. it off? Okay. Uh, let's get back to the slideshow here. We were talking about Hamza's going to be here, and you'll notice Hamza's going to be here several times. He's going to be telling us about uh, some concepts in astroimaging that are true for no matter what you do in astroimaging and stuff like that. And he's going to be showing us some software that he uses to uh, maximize that. Mostly he'll be talking about the concepts. So please come on over and, and visit with us. Uh, that'll start on July 7th. The week after that, we have a processing workshop, and we're going to talk about that in a second or two. Bill Lee coming up talking about free and low cost software. TJ Connolly is gonna get us ready for the Mercury transit. He's a really good solar imager, and I think you'll enjoy that. Um, and we can go, just go down the list here, or you can go down the list. Richard Wright signed on for August 11th, and I think we're pretty well full for a while here, which is cool, that's what we wanna be. Uh, tonight is gonna to be Ray. Uh, this is Ray when he was younger. Uh, he had a camera and he got it to work, and then we realized, wait a minute, where's the guy we were expecting? Ray, as you can see, takes some great astro photos. Uh, this is one of his apods and he's also written a number of pieces of software that we many of us use day in and day well night in and night out mm -hmm. i should say so uh, we'll be we'll be glad to hear from ray and we're going to talk about him in a minute um but i want you to look at the website and this is the website big page at the website here if you come over here you'll notice it says workshop you click on that and this page comes up and I just wanted to share with you that we've been having a devil of a problem this week with this, um, uh, with the imaging workshop. Um, Doug Lala and Janko Mulman have uh, made some submissions and they're both pretty interesting. We were talking about them before the show started. So we're going to be here interesting to hear from others. We hope more of you join. Uh, this is data from NC 1968, NGC 1968. Terry Robeson sent it up. It's from the Southern Hemisphere, something we don't usually get to see. We'd like to have this stuff in within a couple of weeks now because we have to um, we have to invite people to come be part of the show. And part of that invitation is making sure they know how to work their stuff, which means that we really want to have it done on July 7th. We want to be inviting people in. Um, so please get your stuff in. Um, and then on July 14th, we're going to be sharing that. All you've got to do is, is download the data by going to this link 
and uh, choose which of the uh, data you wish to use, uh, the narrowband, the, the RGB, the whatever it is, it is, it's there. Do that. Now, if you want to see how it was done last time, Eric Coles donated some data, and you can go to the this other link here. But you get there by going to the workshop link here. One other thing I want you to notice is that uh, you're looking at a screen something like this, and hopefully some of you are over here. You see, if you're on the website, you've got this little uh, oval with the green and white stuff. It tells you how many people were watching back when I uh, glued this in here earlier today. And you can make comments and contribute to the show in any way. We'll try to read these, and if you got a question for Ray or if you want to comment about something he's saying, you can do that there. Toga, you awake? This is the part yeah, you're talking about. I was going to call you in. There is another yeah, sure. way to do this, and um, we're going to show you this other way to do it. Um, I'm going to get out of here, and I'm going to uh, get over to Tolga if I don't screw uh, that. Can, can, you, can you see my screen right now? Uh, you should see. Okay, Tolga, I got yeah, you. Can you see my screen? Uh, Eric, see my screen? Eric, we good? I don't. I can't see that offhand. Yeah, we're good. If you, if you can, I'll, I'll just I'll just talk about it. <clears throat> if you go to YouTube and you know type uh, Astro Imaging Channel, will show up, and you'll see the uh, uh, you know the live show right now. And then you'll see this chat on the right side, and you could you could uh, you know type your comments here, and we'll also forward them to the presenter as well. Uh, and you guys also can have a conversation between each other, you know, within the, yourselves. Uh, that's, you could do that too. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, and uh, I want to say something about, about, about cool. I want to say something about subscribing to, wh while you're there, once you get to YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. On the, on the bottom right of the video, there is a uh, subscribe button and a notification bell to get notified for new videos. Okay. And the reason we have to ask you to do that is because somebody's got to pay for this thing. And um, we need your help in getting to 10,000 subscription. Where am I supposed to be? I am supposed to be not there, not there. I'm supposed to be way up here. Am I sharing my screen still? Yes. Okay. And you should be back to my PowerPoint. And this Rumble Talk is one way to make your comments, but it costs us. The YouTube doesn't cost us anything. And frankly, most of the people that have tried both just as soon have the, have the uh, YouTube comments. So we may be transiting out of rumble talk at some point um if you get you know as you're listening tonight you might want to make a comment or something about whether you'd rather be in rumble talk or if there's any good reason that you need to keep rumble talk instead of going over to youtube one big advantage of youtube is it saves the conversation and annotates your comments into the conversation so that when people play it back later they can actually see what people had to say at the time it was said during the show. And we think that's valuable and we can't seem to get it out of Rumble Talk. Plus, Rumble Talk costs us some bucks that we'd just as soon save if uh, YouTube comments can do everything we want to do. So that's why we need to ask you about that. Um, we're talking about Ray, and Ray's going to be talking about a whole lot of stuff. So I am going to get out of my PowerPoint here, get out of there. And uh, where am I? And I'm going to turn it over to Ray. You awake, Ray? Take yes. It, you got it. All right. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah, you're good. Working right. telescope tracking. Right. Okay, good. Okay. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, correcting the telescope tracking errors in equatorial mounts. Um, start off here. There's a little background why we're we trying to fix uh, the tracking errors. Um, 
you know, we could auto guide, but uh, every time the auto guider makes a move on um, a star because a star is miscentered, the our image is damaged already by that time. So just think of it of uh, like if you're you're um, you're taking a picture with your DSLR and you move the camera a little bit as you click, you get kind of a blurry image. That's what's happening when you are not keeping the star centered, your your auto guiding star. So it's advantageous for us to try to improve tracking as much as possible. So here are some types of tracking errors. There's um, a slow, steady drift, a fast, random drift. And I'm going to talk about each of these in, in um, later slides. A slow, random drift. There's like sudden shifts that could happen. Um, image shifts, a little bit different, but um, um, also flexure changes as the temperature drop, which causes uh, a little bit of drift that's not uh, uh, corrected. It's not anything wrong with the mount. It's just the telescope on the mount that is actually changing. And then lastly, periodic error. A lot of times when people try to use one of my software applications, PEMPRO, they do um, a correction, a pretty good correction, and they're surprised that afterwards they uh, are still unable to do unguided imaging. Well, there's a lot of these other types of errors here that cause those, those tracking errors. And so periodic error correction is not the only solution that you have to, um, to work on. So some of the causes, um, of course, there's polar alignment error. There's uh, refraction. There's um, mechanical errors like non-orthogonality between RA and declination. That's the mechanical um, er um, manufacturing error, a miscentering or, the or out around worm wheel or the worm itself, which causes periodic error. And the, the worm wheel itself, if that is out around, it causes a, a slow change in uh, tracking. So it might be just slightly faster or slightly slower than sidereal, depending on what part of that worm wheel you're on. It's the wheel that turns once in every 24 hours. So if you were to rotate your, you, really if your mount has clutches and you're able to release the clutches and slew the scope uh, 90 degrees, you might be in a different part of, the, of that worm wheel and your drift might be different, depending how much uh, eccentricity there is in that worm wheel. And of course, the mount itself and the scope has flexure. So this includes the, the OTA itself. It could be any kind of component, um, you know, like the camera connection to the to the to the focuser the weight of it could be causing it to sag or maybe one of the the uh, bolts holding it in one of the screws holding it in is not very strong and allows it to, to move around a little bit a little bit of wiggle the um uh, the focuser itself has a little bit of clearance in it um so if that clearance is too too high there might be a little bit of sagging that occurs from that as well so those are the kind of things that can cause tracking errors um for uh, fast random errors, there, this could be th caused by uh, gear roughness or particulates that could be either in the in the uh, the gears themselves on the gears themselves or in the the um, uh, the grease that are, that the the gears are running in. And uh, there could be low resolution stepper motors; those add a little bit of vibration sometimes to the mount and, and maybe cause um, uh, a visible kind of like vibration or artifacts. And then, of course, there's things like the, the vibration from the camera itself, from people walking nearby, vehicles, earthquakes, whatever else. Anybody have any questions so far? No? Uh, we, we do have one, but I let you go ahead with your presentation for, for a while yet, OK? OK. Oh, by the way, I mentioned this, this first uh, slide, the last slide. This is for uh, some causes of slow, steady drift. And this one was for fast random. I didn't mention that. And now, um, slow random. This is, um, these are two different types of telescopes. One's uh, on the left, a refractor, and one in the, on the right hand side is a Mead LX850. This is after about an hour after, after sunset. And you can see that it's quite a bit warmer than the surrounding area. So, there's what this causes is tube currents inside of the OTA. So, often there are people that are trying to do like, uh, drift alignment either with PEMPRO or PHD2 or some other um, uh, tool that they're seeing these odd uh, you know, patterns where the drift kind of changes. It kind of goes up a little bit and down a little bit. You guys probably know what I'm talking about if you ever use that kind of software. That's usually caused by 
um, localized atmospheric seeing, like t uh, telescope tube currents in particular. And um, I mean, but there's other localized currents too. I have a little clip here of, of um, I took uh, a few years back of the moon, which shows you, I'm gonna show this, I'm gonna, right here in the background. Can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so look at that. If you look at that, you could tell. Well, I, I I know that it's not equal in there. In any part of the image there, there it's like waves going across that the moon surface. There, that's the kind of seeing that you can have sometimes, where it's not just the whole image is being shifted. It's just one part of um, the image, or various parts are, are shifting at at different amounts. So that. Uh, makes it kind of challenging to to um, you know to find the best solution for tracking because you have all these errors are getting introduced to the tracking. Even if you have one star that you're looking at, the one star is just that one part of that image. There might be multiple parts of the image, which if you average them all together, would give you a better estimate of the, the tracking um, errors that are going on at that time. So let me go back. Oh, that didn't do what I wanted it to do. Sorry. Okay, so um, sudden shifts there. This can happen a lot of times with SETs where the optics shift because the mirror is not locked down, or even if it is, it could there could be a shift in the secondary or something else. The camera itself could do that kind of shift. Uh, cable snags, um, either they're they're getting snagged or they're becoming free, and um, uh, the camera and the focuser is not locked down sufficiently. So other sources, uh, image shifting can happen if the camera unexpectedly shifts because it wasn't tightened down. I guess it's kind of similar to the last uh, slide. Um, the focuser is not aligned to the optical axis. Um, so when you um, adjust the focus, it, it, uh, the tracking will be off by a little bit. There will be image shifting that happens. Um, the optics itself, Sudden shifts can happen from optic shifting. Um, again, cable snags and camera focus are now locked down. As the temperature drops, the, the flexibility of most materials, including metals and plastics and things, they, they change. So this is an interesting problem because um, one of the other applications that I've developed um, is for astrophysics and it's called APCC and it has a all sky model. And we're down to the arc second level trying to figure out uh, the tracking errors. And uh, I've noticed that uh, even if you account for refraction, there are changes that can happen to the, 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 the rigidity of the metals and things in the telescope, which change the effective tracking rate. So it's not enough just to have um, the refraction calculation and all the calculations for all the other mechanical um, and pointing errors that, that that could occur. There's also, it's getting to the point where you need to, to take into account the telescope materials themselves, or at least be able to model that as temperature changes. Any questions so far? Um, no? no, we've got some practical application questions coming, but let's get through with the, th oh. let's get through the theory for a while yet. Okay. okay, sure, okay. Okay, so then now periodic errors. Um, in most mounts with gears, there's periodic gear. And you can see right here, you can see my screen, that's the worm, and this is the worm wheel. So this part right here rotates once in about 24 hours, a little bit less than that, 23 hours and 56 minutes and some change. And this rotates depending on how, how many um, teeth there are in here. It will rotate as a fraction of, of that, of that uh, 24 hour, almost 24 hour period. So, and the reason why it's called periodic um, is because one rotation of this happens every time there's one worm period. So it the errors will tend to repeat during that period of time. There are other errors that could happen, like each of these teeth on this, uh, this worm wheel here could have sediment or materials or grease, or they could be uh, some have some manufacturing defects which cause other kinds of tracking errors. That type of tracking error can be fixed with encoders. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that in cloudy nights and other places about um, about uh, various types of uh, 
of um, uh, uh, precision encoders. And uh, those kind of encoders, like absolute encoders, can correct those type of errors. Uh, periodic error correction itself cannot. It can only correct uh, the error that happens here, but it cannot connect correct the error that happens here. So, and by the way, the um, encoders can also fix, like the remember I said earlier that there was um, that these worm wheels can be slightly out of round, so that there'll be an effective tracking rate, uh, you know, slow down in some parts of the worm wheel, and then other parts it'll be faster than sidereal. The an encoder can uh, correct that as well. So the other thing too, where you get errors are in um, in the um, motor box gears. Here's an example. This is from a AP 1200, and um, there's various gears in here. Any of these gears could cause some issues if they're not um, um, tightened down tightly enough, like they've come loose, or they're out of round, or um, there's get some materials in there. Any of those things could cause uh, can cause some tracking um, errors. So some ways to fix the tracking errors. You can do better polar alignment. Um, you can do uh, periodic error correction. You can do um, uh, pointing and tracking rate modeling. And of course, you can get to uh, purchase a mount with a high precision or absolute encoders. But um, that last case there, you still need to have a few things. We still need to have the tracking and pointing uh, rate uh, modeling because uh, it doesn't fix those things. There are other reasons why there, there might be tracking errors, even if you have a, a perfectly tracking uh, telescope. So here's a summary of the errors and what kind of things can be corrected. So oh, one thing I didn't mention is um, about periodic error is that um, you need to have an even number of, um, of um, uh, Waves, I guess we call it, the frequencies inside of it for the for the uh, for periodic error to, uh, correction to be uh, usable for any particular mount. The reason why is that the the uh, most PEC mechanisms only are um, with one or an integral number of um, of worm periods. So if you have one that that uh, happens every 3.7 times uh, per worm uh, per worm period it will not be correctable because it changes phase every single worm period. You can correct the other errors as long as you filter out that error, that, that, that frequency, and um, so, but you cannot fix it, at least not with that. You can, however, fix it with encoders. So in this first line here, you can, the integer, uh, you know, uh, re repeatable errors, you can zero to 120 seconds are, are some of the ranges that you could find amount um, and, and it's correctable with PEC. Uh oh, what happened? Sorry. And um, it's not correctable by modeling. Modeling is what uh, I mentioned before. That's how you you um, point the telescope in various parts of the sky. You you do plate solves and you measure the error at those uh, at the, each of those locations, and then you use some high level math to do. Um, um, uh, linear regression of multiple dimensions to find the, the, the minimized um, parameters at which will pointing and tracking rate correction can can be most effective. Uh, then, so, but you can correct this with encoders. So again, not integer, you can't correct with uh, PEC, you can't correct with modeling, but you can correct with encoders. Then um, the worm, Gear tooth machining errors. That's what I mentioned before. That each of that that worm wheel, if it has errors in, uh, that are uh, repeatable on every single um, tooth or, or portion of the tooth teeth, it, it may be correctable with PEC if it, if it's repeatable every single time. But if it's not, it's not going to be repeat. It's not going to be correctable. But an encoder can correct it. So. And there's just other cases here, like refraction. Refraction can't be corrected with PEC. It can't be corrected with, um, or it can be corrected with, uh, oh, it can be corrected with encoder, sorry, excuse me. And um, same thing with mount flexure, it can't be, but you need, you can correct it as long as you have um, a, a modeling solution for it, software behind it, or a hardware firmware-based solution, like some mounts have. So, and when you get down to, um, Shifting optics and heat plumes, then in those cases there, you're out of luck in terms of uh, fixes. 
there's maybe some mechanical things you can do, like locking down the mirror, tightening up components. But uh, it, it, that those things are random and they cannot be uh, predicted by any kind of software solution. So they, they won't be um, effectively corrected or correctable. I, I have a couple of questions about this uh, chart that you've got here. Sure. Um, yeah, the, and I'm excuse me, but um, I have about three screens I have to monitor to help run this thing. So I sometimes lose track of what's actually been said. What's the difference between oh. periodic error, and integer, and non-integer? I, I may have missed that. You explained it. But. I'm sorry. I, I accidentally clicked something there. Um, yeah. Okay. Per integer means that it repeats an even number of times within one worm period. So say that... Um, Let's take a mount that has eight minute worm period, okay? And then usually the worm itself rotates at eight minutes, but sometimes the manufacturer, most of the time manufacturers have uh, have motors and they try to match those motors up to the same, um, so that they repeat, so that they finish one revolution or even number of revolutions for every worm period. And the reason why they try to do that is that it, that allows it to be corrected by periodic error correction. So because every time it goes through, say that the, the motor itself repeats four times, that would cause a fundamental of four uh, x the the um, the um, worm period. So instead of eight minutes, it would happen every two minutes. But it repeats in phase every eight minutes. It'll happen four times, and at the start of the the fourth one, it'll be back in the same phase as it was in in the at um, four four um, you know cycles before that. So it looks the same. And when you do a, a PEC um, recording of it or a recording of periodic error, the, each of the, the passes look the same. They don't differ from each other. That's integer periodic error. It's not the, the worm itself is, is going to cause the one X fundamental always, but then the, there's usually motors inside of the mount that have um, higher frequencies that might occur. Now, if you, if the manufacturer makes a motor that doesn't repeat you know, every time, and that motor happens to be, have gears that are out around. What happens is that every time the periodic error curve, um, the periodic error starts over in, in the same spot in the worm, it's at a different phase for those gears. So what you get is you you you'll get um, what looks different every single phase of the of the periodic error. It looks it looks it doesn't look the same. It looks different, and when that happens. That's not correctable. At least, not not all the frequencies are correctable. You can you can still correct the worm period or the worm itself, and maybe any frequencies that happen um, an equal number of times in that worm worm uh, period. But you cannot correct those that don't have that don't happen um, uh, an even number of times. So that, that's why. So that's why it's okay. not correctable with PEC, but it is correctable with um, encoders. When you showed us the picture of the worm and ring gear, and explained that. If there is a, a miss, or if there is some defect or something, you, you'll get a slight. Um, that's where your error. Yeah, that one there, you'll get a slight uh, error. It, there's also a motor and other gears moving the ring, uh, moving the worm gear, and everything else. And each one of those have the possibility of being slightly out of round or miscentered or something. Right, right below that uh, picture mm -hmm. is a picture of um, of a. Um, motors, the motors actually itself, and the gears in those motors, and so those those drive um, the, the the mountain as well. So okay, the other question I had, if we go back to that the chart with the pretty colors, is um, I see that it's corrected with encoders, it's corrected with periodic error. If you were to add a column for guiding, now you can't fix it now that it's already wrecked, but you can fix it before it goes any further. And so if you had a column for guiding, uh, how much, how many of these can be kind of remedied with good guiding? I think that most of them can be. I think most of them can. But the goal is to try to minimize those so mm -hmm. you don't, um, you, you don't want to do more than you have to. So if you say that amount is tracking perfectly and it's able to keep the star centered, but there's some heat plumes that are happening once in a while. And that it causes like real slow shifts of where the star is located at. Auto guiding could could uh, correct for that if it really was truly you know shifting the refraction of air in some way. Um, but it might not be able to. But if it, because it, the the tracking was really good all through the rest of that time that time that duration of a, of an image there, the image will have a better result. Will look sharper. Will have a um a um you know lower um the star size itself. 
Okay, Sorry. thank you. Now, um, Morgan and a few of you, you folks over in Rumble Talk are having a conversation, or uh, had a conversation about some uh, advice for periodic error. I'm, I'm, I know you're there. I'm going to hold off until we get through some more of the theory, and uh, maybe it'll be covered as we go, and uh, then we'll get, we'll come back to you, Tolga. You're monitoring the YouTube chat. Is there anything we need to know about from the YouTube chat? Not a, not a specific question directed to Ray. There is a conversation going about uh, about PEC and certain mounts, but uh, we'll save that till later. Okay, thank you, Ray. I think we're we're good for you to just keep going. Okay. Okay. I, I don't have a whole lot more here, and I was going to show some of the things that uh, some of the questions that people had with um, PEMPRO um, issues like with cameras and stuff like that after I'm done with this. But um, so let me go on here. Okay, so like modeling, uh, periodic error correction, what it does is it tries to preemptively correct any periodic error that it can. And it can only do that for those frequencies that happen in a um, integer number of times in one worm period. And it's available on most mounts. Not all mounts have it. Some mounts implement it better than others. Um, and like I said, I guess I've said this a number of times now, it only corrects periodic errors that occur an integer number of times in a warm period. So um, some things that you need to do to measure periodic error with PEMPRO is you need to have the mount, mount well polar aligned. And by that, I'd say within 10 arc minutes is probably good enough. Really what you want to do is make sure that the star that you're tracking on uh, and in this could this could be used with PhD two as well. PhD two, there's um you can just turn guiding off if you just want to measure the periodic error. I have a tool for that which I'm going to show you in a second, which um is absolutely free and you can use it to look at your um your periodic error of your mount without having to to um, use PEMPRO or anything like that. So, um, but usually what you want to do is have the mount well polar aligned and you want to point just west of the meridian near about zero declination and the camera rotation should be roughly east west but it's you know or north south not mandatory though so um some other things the image scale best results 0.5 to 2 arc seconds these are just tips here in case you you are using pem pro um you want to make sure you do the calibration you want to then after you do the calibration you acquire um the periodic error with uh, PEC off, then you create a PEC curve. You can upload and play back a curve to the mount. Those are two different uh, mechanisms. Some mounts um, like Lesmondi, Gemini's, the astrophysics, the paramounts, you can upload a curve. Other mounts um, do not have the ability to update or upload to the mount. So you have to do what's a playback. So um, PEMPRO would play back the inverse of that. And then afterwards, you confirm the result by turning the PEC on and you know, and um, and then capturing more data again to make sure that the that the periodic error is reduced, and then you can refine or re, re, um, invert uh, the curve as needed. And then um, afterwards, like that, I guess is what I just said is just to make sure you confirm the results. And um, there are some limitations though to the PC mechanism. Some mounts like Celestrons only have 88, so that's only about once every five or six seconds that it gets updated. Usually that's enough, but sometimes it might not be. And then sometimes there might be um, some fundamentals which don't have happen in integer number of times. One um, common one is um, is Mead. Mead LX200s have a, a frequency that happens um, every eight, it's, it's um, every 24 minutes. So what they did to solve this problem is they actually have a three worm cycle uh, periodic error uh, curve. And so because of that, they can actually fix that that uh, that particular case there. And then some of the cell values themselves are nonlinear, making it difficult for, for PEC to work well with it. So here's the utility I was telling you about before. It's a, called PEMPRO Log Viewer. And um, it's, it can read PhD2 or PEMPRO logs. And so you could turn um, you could turn off tracking on uh, auto guiding on PhD2 and then capture any number of worm cycles and it'll, it'll give you a, a good estimate of what your worm, um, what your periodic areas, your mount and any other fundamentals that are there. And absolutely free and need to buy anything. So, um, 
And I think that there's there's a number of people that are using this utility out there now. So, oh, I was going to show you, there's a hint when you're doing polar alignment. Now I'm going to start talking a little bit about polar alignment now. This is um, a picture right here of uh, of my um, at one of my astrophysics mounts, and uh, those. This is the azimuth adjustment. This this area right here. There's two knobs on each side, and those knobs and those lines on it are calibrated to to be about 1.5 arc minutes per per notch. And there's actually a way to do that to calculate it. If you have like the center point, you have a center point here in the mount. You calculate the distance, the radius, basically to where from the the, the, the pivot point in the azimuth is to where those those uh, knobs are. Because most mounts have these azimuth type knobs. They may not look like this, but they, they usually have them. And then you can, by, when you have that, you can actually calculate the total um, uh, turn, or the, the total, I guess, circumference of the, the, the circle that goes around. So then what you want to do is you figure out how many turns per inch these um, the, the screws have here. So from that, you can calculate by just uh, one turn, how much of a, uh, how many inches or a fraction of an inch the mount moves along that circumference. From that, you can calculate the number of degrees. And now since you have, in this case here, in, in the astrophysics mounts, this one here has these notches here, which already have been um, pre-calculated to be 1.5 arc minutes. When you're, when you're using um, any kind of polar alignment tool, whether it's PEMPRO or something else, if it tells you how far off you are, east or west, you can, easily just move the, the correct number of, uh, of, of, of those lines to get you really close. So it's a real big time saver. And I'm going to show you a trick. You, some of you may have seen this before. I have a video for it. And the, the trick is this. Normally, there's a right in between here. Can you see my cursor, people? Can you see this cursor here? Right between yes, there? we can see the cursor. Okay. Usually there's a there's like a little bar that's in the middle there that, that allows those those knobs to push on. And so one trick you can do is when they're both tightened down, if you want to, I found before it was kind of hard to kind of like push it a certain amount and, and make sure it gets the right amount. Sometimes you overshoot. So what you do is you you loosen up the reverse side by the exact amount that you need to go. Say you want to do the right hand side um, like five of those notches. What you do is you loosen that side five notches so that it's after it's, it's been tightened down, both our bolts are tightened down. You loosen it five um, notches, and then the other side, you just tighten it up until it's tight. So it moved it automatically by five notches. So I have a little video here in the background. So. There's no um, sound to it, but. So you can adjust it that way. And I, I put um, something in the center, a little Allen wrench to show how. So you loosen up one side and now you tighten the other side up. And so it it uh, it adjusts the mount just the right amount. So you so when you are you get feedback from PhD2 or from PEMPRO, PEMPRO's polar alignment wizard, how many arcs arc minutes you need to move them out. You can, if you know the amount that um, each rotation of those knobs turns, you can very quickly you know, uh, hone in on, on your polar alignment. Any questions? Um, yeah, we we did have one. It's uh, not exactly on the topic, but uh, Glenn, I think, was asking, um, how can you tell the difference between periodic error and seeing conditions? Well, if it's usually if it's repeatable, you want to you want to collect about five to six worm cycles, typically for PEMPRO at least to, and you'll you'll be able to tell that there's um I mean unless the worm the um the periodic error is very low, you will be able to see that there's a pattern invoking there, and then by using fast Fourier um, transforms and other algorithms, the the even if there's noise there, PEMPRO and other programs can can pull out. Um, the, the frequencies that are, you know, present in that data. That, that's what PEMPRO does for a living. It, right. It, it it runs it for four or five seconds. You, so you run it for four or five cycles, and then it says, okay, cutting out all the seeing and other weird stuff, this is in general what happens every time the, the, the machine goes around. Right. There's actually a related question on YouTube over there to the subject. Uh, Bruce asks... Um, well, you know, if you could talk about a little bit of different algorithms in PEMPRO, like the cubic and the lin linear, 
how would they differ from each other and what's the you know what are the best practices to get the best uh results from Pempro? okay so the those are actually just trying to remove the drift they're not the actual algorithms themselves what linear is doing is that depending on how many worm cycles and how many minutes that there have been um involved in collecting the data it won't appear to be a straight line anymore there'll be kind of an arc it's actually kind of sinusoidal in nature but um a poly um a polynomial uh, will will represent it very well will fit it very well so if it's a shorter period um a, a linear is usually good enough but usually quadratic or higher terms might be necessary so how do you tell so here's what i usually do and i recommend so when you're you're in there and you're trying to figure out the right drift, drift fitting for it, start off with linear and look at the RMS error, okay? Then increase the, the number again to like quadratic and then look at the RMS number to see how, how it compares. Did it improve a lot? If it improved a lot, then you're going the right way. If it didn't improve a lot, say it's almost the same, then you back off to the one before it. So, and that's the one you want to stay at because otherwise it's just it's just um, trying to fit data that doesn't uh, isn't really um, drift itself. So it's really a matter of the RMS. Watch your RMS. Watch how it goes down. If it doesn't change very much between when you um, increase the the, the uh, polynomial fit on it, just back off one at that point, and that's where you want to be at. Does that make sense? Yes. I also. Uh, I'll I'll say it, but you should you may want to talk about it too. The 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 refine curve function also uh, I love that function about Pempro because even uh, let's say you you measure the uh, the error and you apply it to the mount and you re remeasure it with the peck applied this time and correct right correct me if I'm wrong yeah and then you see the residual periodic error. And then you may have overcorrected it or undercorrected it, and you can refine the curve. Uh, am I right? That's correct. And usually, you shouldn't have to use that refined curve. Use usually, if you do it right the first time and have the right um, scaling, and provided that the PEC correction is doing the right thing. Because sometimes some firmware and some mounts don't have the best um, PEC mechanisms, and so and some of them are scaled. Um, non-linearly. So when that happens, it may not um, produce the best result and it may be possible to improve it a little bit because maybe there was a little bit of offset um, um, one way or another that caused the exponential or non-linear um, value inside of a PEC table to be, to be maybe it could have used one more um, incremental, increment of, the, of its value to get a better fit for it. But um, often that is used when um, someone doesn't do the right calibration, doesn't do the calibration. So the image scale, they, they think they know what the image scale is. They think they know what their telescope's uh, focal length is, and it's usually not exactly what the, what the manufacturer said. So the manufacturer says it's 700 millimeters focal length. A lot of times it's not that. It might be 750, it might be 760, it might be, it's usually not less. It's usually higher than whatever the manufacturer said. And um, so they have a different image scale than what they expected, and so they end up with, uh, with but just entering a number. Well, I know my image scale is, is it should be, you know, 700 millimeters divided by my pixel size. There's an algorithm for that to calculate, you know, the, the right um, image scale, and that's the number they put in. They think they know it, but doing the calibration procedure is is really important. And so, and when you do it right, you shouldn't need to do the refinement. But if you do. Then it's it is exactly like you said. It's there to to take that delta of what's that whatever the residual is it allows you to add it back into the curve and then send it back to your mount. Another case where that could happen too is if the phase is wrong. So if the phase of the mount is wrong somehow, um, um, there's there's various reasons why that could happen. If you are doing the playback mechanism, there's no way for PEMPRO to ask them out what its phase is. So that's why it's really important going through all the steps of the periodic error correction that you do not touch the mount. Do not hit RA. I mean, not I mean, you could touch the mount, but you don't want it to. You don't want to move the mount from its RA and deck it's sitting. It just let it track and don't do anything to it. Because if you move it, then the phase is lost at that point, and PEMPRO won't know it. So. <clears throat> It's it's important, but if it happens, there's still a way that you can get back the, um, the, the 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 corrected curve by 
um, doing an refinement. Again, you can add the two curves together and, and it'll actually result in, in the right phase being uh, uh, calculated. So, you could answer your question. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, actually, the question came from a viewer on YouTube. Uh, but there's a, there's another one. Uh, this one comes from Ray. Uh, he he wants to know if you could talk about a little bit of understanding the data. Once you collected the cur you, the data and you have a curve in front of you, um, you know how do you record it to the mount and uh, I told them like it, the, the procedure depends uh, on the mount. Each mount is your procedure yeah. is going to be different. But I guess he wants to know a little bit about how, how do you inspect the curve and how do you make sure that it's okay and how do you understand it? Well, it's there's it's very simple. The very the very first thing it needs to do is is to analyze for frequencies that are repeating, and. Um, that's why when you collect the data, you want to collect five or six worm cycles. The more worm cycles that you collect, the more um, accurate the frequencies will be. So if you collect one worm cycle of data and it, it shows you a frequency at you know whatever whatever however many seconds it is, it will be possibly off. FFTs are not perfect. They're, they're, it depends on when you start sampling and what, um, how many samples you, you um, have and if they're equal. And um, so if you, you do the, uh, the analysis on it, it's possible that it is going to be off by a little bit. So it's better to do more worm cycles rather than less. So um, by looking at multiple worm the, cycles. Uh, that would take care of the seeing question as well. The more. Yes cycles you collect, you're going to average out the scene. That's correct. It's not it's averaging out the scene. It's actually just, it's actually eliminating it. What it's looking for are, are um, repeating frequencies that are in, within the data, hidden within the data. You may not even see them. In fact, even with data that looks jumbled, you know, because you know how PEMPRO shows you frequencies that are, um, that are worm cycle to worm cycle. But you can have a frequency that, that, like I said before, is not an integer, not an integer. So it comes up uh, like as a mess of data. And when that mess of data is there, you won't be able to tell what frequencies are there. But through FFT and other algorithms, PEMPRO can can pick out those frequencies and the amplitudes of those frequencies and tell you what it is. So even though you can't correct it, what it does offer you then is, um, and again, this doesn't have to be with PEMPRO. You can do this with PhD2 as well, free. You don't have to buy PEMPRO to do this. You can use the free PEMPRO log viewer. You can use PhD2 to collect your data. You then can can analyze it with, uh, with the PEMPRO log viewer. It could tell you those frequencies there. And if there was a mechanical issue, you might be able to go to the manufacturer and say, look, I'm getting this frequency that happens 7.2 times. So I'm just giving an example here, you know, per, per worm period. Is there any mechanical component in there that could be doing that? And it's probably going to be in the motor someplace. They might be able to say, well, maybe send us the motor or maybe, you know, we can replace it. And, and they give you a new, new motor that fixes the problem or reduces the, the error at that frequency. At least you know where to look. It helps you look because there's not that many things that are, are gonna cause um, a frequency 7.2 times the worm period and the manufacturer should know what those are. So it's it's also a tool for analyzing problems with the, with tracking, with periodic error and, and you know, the mount itself. So. Go ahead. Uh, what, there's one more question. It's actually Terry's asking from within the room. Um, is, uh, is there a, what is the best uh, place in the sky to collect the uh, data? I usually like to recommend at zero declination just west of the meridian, but sometimes people can't do that because there's a, a tree or a house or whatever in the way. You can do that. You can collect data up to about 65 degrees north or south of the uh, of the equator if it's um, of the uh, you know the celestial equator. So, um, but but also near the meridian is best so that it minimizes the amount of, uh, of refraction that's actually happening because at that point, there's not much change in, in altitude. There is a little bit of change, but it's not as much as if as um, it is in other parts of the sky, potentially. That's the best place. When, As you know, when you're looking at, at any any star, the highest place in the sky that it's going to be is going to be right at the meridian. So you that's where you want to image it at. And you can do anything between um, um, positive 65 to negative 65. Well, obviously, if you're in the southern hemisphere, you, you probably want the negative numbers. But 
Um, but zero deck is is ideal though, because at there at that place, the the uh, periodic error is maximized. As you know, as you approach the um, the poles itself, the um, RA becomes smaller and smaller, vanishingly small. It goes as the as the cosine of the declination. Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of of well, one is actually the, the ninety degrees is um, a, is um I'm sorry cosine of 90 degrees is zero at that point and that that number gets multiplied by the the right ascension error so if you're like looking at the pole you would never see any pole periodic error there you're, it's maximized at zero deck and that's where yeah. you want to measure that's where that's the ideal place yes right unless you're at the north pole you're in North Pole, then zero deck is at your, you know, <laughs> is at your horizon. It probably wouldn't be a good place. Mm -hmm. Too much air there. <laughs> okay. How you doing, Tolga? YouTube comments? Um, the, the, do you have any more? Do you have any on Rumble I, Talks? I have some Rumble Talks, yes. Yeah, you wanna, why don't you take care of those? Okay. Uh, let's go to Linda first. Um, uh, earlier, Ray, you were talking about... Um, uh, running and then rerunning your curves, uh, whether you're linear or quadratic and stuff like that. Um, linear, quadratic, and then you change them until the RMS doesn't change much. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean very much? Um, well, you'll, you'll be able to tell. If you go to zero, there's usually drift. Almost always there's going to be drift in, mo in most mounts, um, in RA or deck. Unless you're running a, a real good model, you're going to see some drift, either from refraction or whatever else. So you go from no um, uh, curve fit to linear, you're going to see that the RMS is going to drop quite a bit. So then you go, let's say, say that goes from like 24 as an RMS. I'm just throwing out numbers here. It might go to five. Our RMS arc, arc seconds if you go to linear, and then you go to um, to quadratic, and it goes down to 4.0. Then you go to uh, uh, the cube cubic. At that point, it becomes 3.8. The difference between 3.8 and 4.0 is not much. It's like a, just a fraction of it. So at that point, you would want to go back to doing the uh, the quadratic and not the cubic. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, the, yeah. I, it does to me. I'm not. It still is a is is a experience thing. When you feel that it's you're not getting any more bang for the buck, you can stop spending your bucks. That's right. And it's it's even worse than that though, because what's happening is when you start doing that, you're starting to falsely, um, uh, you know, remove drift. Remove drift that's not there. You might even be taking some of the periodic air out of the drift at that okay. point. So that's why you really don't want to go too far with that. I, I, I can't, I haven't seen very many cases where going higher than quadratic is really worthwhile. Usually linear is good enough. Quadratic is about the most you want to do. And cubic, I've not seen very, very many cases where that's necessary. Okay. Can, can I ask a related question? Sure. And I know your software does this, but I, you know, so I'm going to ask so that you can actually um, talk about it. Uh, can you guide on deck while you're collecting uh, periodic error? Um, can you guide on deck? I don't know. No, I don't. Can, know. can you, you talk about RA track guide error uh, correction, but only uh, guide on deck? You could. You could just guide on deck, but it's still, it's still. You don't really want to do that because. Uh, there might be some play, cross play between crosstalk between the axes. And if you're not perfectly aligned, well, it, it, uh, you probably could get away with that. You probably could. Um, is the reason why you're thinking there's a lot of, uh, a lot of drift from uh, polar alignment? No, I'm, I'm just saying, like if somebody, you know, th they see a lot of drift and their, you know, guide stars start moving out of their, their guide box. Yeah. And you know, well, I've, I've seen people do it. I, I just wanted you to talk about it. Well, one of the cool things about that PEMPRO log viewer is that it can take the PHD2 guide values and produce the periodic error from it. And so what you do is you, you say you have an auto-guided um, PHD2 log. You can load that up into the PEMPRO log viewer. And if um, you know that it has auto-guiding in it, because you can select the segments and it actually tells you if there's auto-guiding on there, um, you can... You can um, uh, 
like add the guiding back into it so you can see the periodic error. I don't know if I have, maybe I have one here. Oh, well, I'll bring it up here in a second. And can you guys still see the screen here? Yeah, we're, we're looking at the uh, movie, the end of the movie. Oh, okay. Now All right. We're, yeah, we're, we're cool. We're seeing it. I got to see if I have one that has, um, I don't know if I have one here that um, it's on, it's a different computer than I normally use. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, you know, I, I wasn't prepared to, to look for one. Let me, let, let me do it this way here. Um, let's see. Oops. I tried that. Well, that did not work the way I wanted it to. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I don't even have everything on here. Oh, darn it. There's a utility which uh, allows you to search for certain types of files. I'm sorry. I, I'm just not prepared to do that. But it, this this utility here is what I was talking about. There is one here, which is a sample one. But it doesn't. I know it doesn't have, at least I think it does. Yeah. So here's here's what it looks like. Um, you can select the different types of mount. It even will give you a, you select uh, whichever segment in the file you have here. These are all actually, these are guided here, but I don't know that they're actually guiding. So, but you, as you see here, you can click on each of these segments here where there's data and uh, it'll show you immediately what the periodic area is and actual values and finds all the frequencies there. And you can do things like you can adjust the drift. You can you can derotate de the data here. Like, um, I don't know if this is gonna, whoops, I'm gonna do this here. So you see how it's rotating around itself. That's, it's uh, rotating the deck and the RA axis upon itself. So you could see, you know, as a, it kind of looks like a three dimensional, you know, barbecue, you know, that's kind of like rotating around as I, as I change the, the, the rotation on it. And, um, but this right here, this is the option I'm talking about. When you click that right there, and you're looking at a PhD2 log that has uh, guiding data in there, it will it'll add it in so you can usually see pretty close to what the periodic area is. The problem is with using guiding, though, is that, um, that when any guider says to move, say, 86 milliseconds, the mount almost always is not able to move 86 milliseconds exactly. So those corrections when they sum up are, are are not as good as letting it go unguided so that it could be anal analyzed better so but theoretically i guess to answer your question tolga was tolga right that asked the question you could yeah. you, you could guide on deck only and yeah. then just look at the ra if you wanted to just the only advantage i see to doing that though is just that it is um um the the star might not drift off the the sensor but you really don't know because Pempro will derotate the, de de the data. It won't even care. Your drift could be humongous in, in deck, and it won't care as long as it doesn't go off the, the sensor. Right. So, <laughs> that's the big thing, though, because off the sensor, then you lose you know data at that point. So that's why I say that's the only reason for having the polar alignment relatively good. And um, so... Yeah, usually if your polar alignment's off by a little bit, it doesn't matter because if you're around the meridian, the RA is is pretty much immune to that. You can you can be off by quite a bit in in uh, polar alignment, and RA is not affected so much by the meridian at the meridian. Declination can be, but not so much the the RA. So um, that's why it's another good reason to use uh, to to try to collect data near the meridian. I wouldn't do it across the meridian though. There's a problem with that some in some mounts where the balance shifts between mounts. So if you start, you might think it's a good idea to start just on the um, the east side of the mount and, and you know just to go across the meridian and keep going there. But um, you know, like from a, a, a counterweight up, if you know what I mean, the, the, the telescope's below the counterweight and then go across the meridian there. But the problem there is that um, the balance shifts across or can shift across it depending on what type of mount it is. And you might get uh, spots where the, the worm is actually kind of floating on top of the, the worm wheel and it's not really accurate, uh, uh, not really a, an accurate representation of the periodic error of the, of the worm at that point. <clears throat> Ray, can I ask a question? Of course you can. Um, I've had a uh, 
I'm out for a number of years, six, seven years, and uh, it's, it's, it's an AP900. Uh, mm-hmm. If I want to redo the PEC, where would I start? Would I remove the existing curve or, or would I refine the curve? Uh, which which control box do you have? Um, the, the one before the last with the V chip. CP3? CP3. Yes, okay. with, the, with the V chip. Yeah, you could. I I don't think that the if it's been a few years, I don't think it's going to be a valid curve anymore. It's um every few months or so the the gears they they change a little bit. They actually become smoother over time. Um, so the periodic error might even go down, and and over that period of time, and it's usually not the same. If you're changing different amount of of, um, uh, weights on the telescope, that could affect it too. There's a lot of things that will affect it. So. The best thing to do is just to start from scratch, just measure the curve um, with, peer, uh, with PEC off, measure the data, and then then apply a curve to it. And it should do pretty good. It should be less than one arc second afterwards with when PEC you, on. When you apply the curve, does it write, overwrite the existing curve straight away? Yep, sure does. I okay. wouldn't worry about that though. If you're, it, it was the mount, did the mount have its original periodic error curve from the fa- factory? Is that what yeah. you're worried about? Uh, well, yeah, because I mean, I, I look at the curve now, and it's a beautiful sinusoidal wave. Before it had a few abrupt changes, uh, they're oh. very, very, very smooth now. Well, you can make a very smooth curve with PEMPRO too. When you do the, when you bring up PEMPRO, there's when you create a curve from the data. Oops, wrong. Here, um, there's when you get to the to the place where you actually create the curve. You can unselect frequencies you don't want. If you want a really nice sine wave and you only want to correct the um, the, the the worm itself, then what you want to do is you could just un- uncheck everything except for one. That will correct. One is the one that will correct always the 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 worm itself. So I don't know if I have any data here again. I just didn't think about that. So let's see. I don't know if this is. This is um. Let me check check here real quick. This is PC. Okay. See, this is PC on. And if one of these have PC off, so I'm looking right here. See this PC state. This is with it with it on, and I, I really want to see one with with it off. Um. Uh, maybe all these are. Oops. Are on. No. Well, that didn't. Oh, there's more here. Oh, what is that doing there? It's in an AP1200 folder. I have, um, I guess I do have some data here, but there's not PhD2 data. Wait, there should be something here. No, oh, why is it doing? Okay, so here's something without, this has a lot of drift in it, but you can, let's see if we can create a curve here. So when you create a curve here, okay, see this RMS area here? It's linear 890, okay? If I go to, let's go to none first of all. It should be, see that number? Really big number, okay? Because the data's got a lot of drift in it. So it's not doing any drift. So you can see the lines are divergent from each other. So I go to linear and it's gonna be much tighter. 0.890. 0.890. Now, if I go to quadratic now, 0.880. Okay, that's not that's not good. So, I think it's here. Linear is probably what I want. But unfortunately, this has so this must be a curve with correction on because there's nothing here. There's hardly any um, any um, amplitude. Now, see the reason why it's showing zero here right now is because I have the filters on. So, if I turn it off. The filter is off. So what it was doing is looking for a minimum PE. The reason why I usually do that is because a lot of times there's fake or false fundamentals and in, in caused by seeing conditions and a bunch of other things that are not real. Usually you you could find out from the manufacturer what frequencies are actually part of amount. So one is always going to be there, number one. And it looks like in this case here, what if this curve is, I'm not sure if this curve was after PEC, it probably is. It's, it's um, 0.279 seconds. So we'll, it's actually double this. This is the amplitude. So it's actually the full swing is about 0.56, about a half arc second, peak to peak, which isn't bad, pretty good. So um, 
But when you, you create this curve here, this is where you, if you want to have a real smooth, smooth curve, this is the way to do it. You just select one here. And if I create that curve and close, say, okay, oh, I got to give it a different name. Wait. Uh, oh, that's why I'm on a different, I'm, I'm looking at data on a different, <laughs> at a different computer, which I can't write to. Yes. Okay, so it didn't write the data, but it did still do this curve here. Now, here's one thing you, I don't know if you knew you could do, but I actually want to go to this here. This is what it looks like here in, um, in, in actual form. This is a true sine wave here. But when you go to the AP raw PE curve here, it, it gets inverted, and there's only certain levels. The, the level is only like point, um, 0.2. Uh, yeah, 0.27 or so. That's the minimum level of a PEC correction that there is for this particular mount. I'm not sure which mount it was, but um, that's what that's what it is. That's why it looks like this. So um, if there's more periodic error, it's going to be a lot smoother looking than this. But this this is what it looks like with in its raw data form. I know. It, uh, did I ask, answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So I would basically uh, start from scratch. Right over the you want to, yes. Okay. And have the camera oriented on the cardinal points. It can be. It doesn't have to be. It's it's better to be kind of close. You don't have to make it like within like five degrees or, you know, 10 degrees, 15 degrees is fine. Pempro will figure out how to do that. I actually have a, um, a short video on how to do the calibration. I should post all of these up so that uh, people can. This is the calibration wizard here. It's really easy to do. I think it's only one minute and 15 seconds. See, I clicked up here to get the wizard. The first thing you do is you take an image and then you select a few stars on each point. See, I click there, click there, click another one here. That's sped up here. That's why it's going so fast. So it's not to take time, but you can zoom in and then it's calculating the angle and the distance and it gives you a pretty good value for arc seconds and you know so then you go to this step here if you're running a, um, a cp3 you don't need to do this step it even tells you up here but i did it anyway and this is just to, to calculate the guide rate so again you do the similar thing as what um, you did before in the last step and you just select one end of a couple of trails and it calculates that guide rate in this case it, it came to about 0.96 and I knew the real guide rate's 1.0. Then this last step here, it's only four steps. This last step, you're just going to look for the shape of the L. It's all cut short here because it's usually about 15, 20 seconds or so to take those images, but I just sped them up. So, and you click it in there, there and you're done. Once you do that step there, you should be ready to go, ready to start acquiring data at that point. And when you click, you want to make sure you disable PEC first. And they're going to see now, now it's sped up again pretty fast, but I, I stopped right there. So you want to see what it, I'll show, let me show you what an encoder mount does with this. I have one, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, let's see, this one here, with, this is actually PhD2. So this is, this is something I did last night. This is with the AP, my AP 1100, and uh, it's also running modeling. So I, the idea here was just, I was going to show you how to connect with uh, the PhD with phd2 and so um and it's going to speed up real fast here so do you do the calibration and you know connect to the different uh, cameras in this case i was using a load star and um and the mount maybe it's a 1100 go to with uh, with encoders and it's about ready to go i think oh it's going to do the calibrate first this this will go pretty quick here so again this is going to get sped up real quickly to go to zero deck and west of the meridian and about a couple of degrees from the from the meridian so now it's there then it's going to do the calibration the calibration gets sped up again here and it looks like it looks horrible. The... So this is sped up 60 times. So real quick here. And then I start collecting the data. Now it's ready to go. 
And now you're going to see what, what happens with, uh, this is with modeling turned on. And um, I'm going to disable PC because there's actually an encoder. But there's no adjustments for drift or anything like that. But you see where it's at. <laughs> it's, uh, it can go pretty long time um, unguided at that. But that's what you get when you get encoders and you do, um, when you do uh, uh, modeling on it. So the modeling is APC, is that correct? Yeah, that's an AP uh, 1100 with, uh, with the AE the encoders on it. So actually, there's just only a couple more slides I have here. I mean, if I sure. can get through these here, there's another another case here, refraction here, and how that affects um, the um, tracking based initial also positioning by, and it varies by temperature, pressure, and humidity. And there's a number of different algorithms that are out there. And probably none of them are exactly perfect. So, but um, it, they, they're just there. They're all roughly the same, but there's, it's a very complex problem. And lots of people have, have come up with different solutions for it. So, and then, um, then mount, uh, scope flexure. This is, um, again, can be um, fixed by, um, modeling the software or modeling um, the mount pointing. And uh, you do that with um, by taking plate solves and uh, uh, matching up the position of the, where the scope thinks it's pointing with where it uh, actually is based on the plate solves. And then from that, you can create a mount model, which um, you can use then to have improved pointing and also improved tracking rate performance. And so and then this just it basically explains how it um, works. And um, I'm probably approaching my time limit. I was going to go through a little bit about that, but uh, if. Um, OK, hang, can... hang on here. We don't have actual time limits. We, we'd we have to be much more organized to have time <laughs> limits like that. Um, but we do have a man named, I think a man named Morgan Dollar, that has been asking questions most of the night. And I have been kept saying, hey, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. So I'm going to go through some Morgan Dollar questions for you. OK. And then and then you take as much time as you like. And if somebody you know, it needs to stop their YouTube when they're watching it and come back later, or they can do that. But that's, I mean, as long as you've got time, we got time. It's okay. Okay. Morgan wants to know um, if, um, uh, if my T mounts are, uh, can be used with PEMPRO. My T as in Paramount? Yeah, Paramounts, right. Yes, they can. And how it works is uh, it doesn't have a direct upload because uh, software BIS doesn't, um, specify it there's there's not an api interface that they have publicly defined but what it does is uh, pempro can create a um a, a text file that you would just upload directly to it through the sky axe so yes and there's a pempro works with all the different uh types of paramounts okay. that are out there besides maybe that new one that has like it's a, um um i forget what model is a taurus or something i'm not sure that um, in mid-August sometime, Richard Wright will be here, and we can ask him that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Morgan, Brian is, is Morgan's real name. Uh, just mentioned that uh, um, Ray just mentioned scaling during periodic error correction training. My question was about the different results from two scopes on the same mighty mount. Um, it, should he be getting different results in the periodic training? Um, it it could be it's possible. Um, I think that there have been a there, let me backtrack here. I don't have firsthand experience of this, but I have seen. Well, I should say have, but I don't know. I just from the information I've been given, I've been giving given um, Pempro logs from a couple of the older Paramounts. I don't know if this applies to the newer ones that had very heavy twenty inch RCOS telescopes on them. And their their periodic errors had gone from you know really low, like in a two to three arc second range, to uh, much higher in the nine to ten arc second range for unknown reasons. Nobody ever was able to figure out why. And it's not that didn't happen in just one mount; it happened on several. I don't know how many others there there might have been, but I I suspect that the only way that could happen is if some of the gears were kind of soft. You know, they're, 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 they have really smooth tracking on the paramounts. 
So and maybe the, the metals that they use are, are, are soft to be able to, to cut them in such a way that there's not uh, any kind of burrs or whatever else in the, in the, um, in the tracking. And then maybe there's some other reasons too. I, I'm just guessing here. Um, so it it's, I guess- He could be putting the, um, the image scale wrong. It could be. Also, the image scale could be wrong. The rotation. Yeah, you have to do the calibration. Yeah, you have to do the calibration. If the camera's not rotated correctly, that could be a factor too. So there's um, there, there's a few other ways besides that that could cause that. Um, also, there have been cases where uh, periodic error is measured to be different on one side of the mount versus the other side of the mount. And the reason why I think that happens is that um, Depending on the weight, how the weight of the the telescope is against the uh, the counterweights and all that, the 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 um, worm can sometimes be floating. I even mentioned this once before, floating on that on that uh, worm gear, and so it's not really fully engaged, and so it doesn't give the full periodic error in that. It looks a lot better than it should be because it's floating. It's not actually digging deep into the gear, so it's not actually causing the as much periodic error as it should. So that's also a possibility too. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen that on a Paramount um, before, though. A lot of times people don't do it on both sides of the mount. It's it's you know if you want to try looking in both sides of the mount, I be I wouldn't be surprised if you'd see a little bit of difference in some mounts. Okay, um, Morgan, I, I don't know if I mean uh, Brian. I don't know if we're answering your. I don't know if we're even asking your question correctly. Um, I, you, you've heard what the answer is. Why don't, why don't you type us some more here, if you can? And I think Ray said he had a few more things he wanted to show us. No, I'm on the last slide right now. This is all I really want to talk about. Unless you want me to, someone wants me to show them APPM or, or um, actually, I, I, I was, not much I can do right now because the yeah. sky is, is light here. But here's, here's something that's interesting for those people out there that, uh, um, let's see if it's still there. This is about an hour and a half ago. Um, I was, uh, this is uh, a t uh, my scope in my backyard and I have a video camera on it. And yeah, it's still there. Can you see it? It's about the same spot. This has been going for about an hour and a half and it's almost in exactly the same spot it was. That's Arcturus in daylight. I have it, I have the video camera in it. It's, um, uh, oh, what is the manufacturer? It's a uh, imaging source camera and monochrome camera and I have it set to just the right settings that I could just get to see it during the daytime. So that uh, one of the things I was gonna do is, is uh, maybe I can adjust this a little bit more because it is getting a little bit dimmer outside, but you could actually look at periodic error in the daytime if you have a bright enough star to be able to do it. So you can see, just so I can prove to you that it's there, that it actually is there. Do you guys see this little thing twinkling here? Yeah, I, well, I can see it. Okay, uh, watch, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move it. See, do you see it move? It move right now. I yeah. can see it on the original, but I'm not sure it's translating all the way out to, to the YouTube version. Okay. We, we you see it better now? As we go. You see it now? That's Arcturus right there. Okay. And it's been tracking there for about uh, hardly changed for about an hour and a half now. I'm just doing some testing on a new version of uh, of APCC Pro, which has better tracking performance. But so anyway, that do you see it moving around now? Yeah. Yes. So that's a magnitude zero. That's, that's in the room. I'm not sure anybody out there. Okay, George. George says he can see it. So we got somebody out there who can see it. Is George one of those people that watches on the 55-inch screen? <laughs> well, anyway, you can kind of see it now. It's uh, it's um, Pempro has the ability to to track the star, even if you set the video settings correctly, even in the middle of the day. The reason why the centroid is blinking in and out is it's it's hitting above the, uh, the signal to noise threshold. If I go too low though, it's gonna go crazy and, and not have a good track on it, but it looks like it's pretty steady now. Yeah, see, it just goes a little bit crazy when you do a little bit too low. It's just not enough uh, signal to noise on it. Let me see if I can bring it out a little bit more. I don't know, I don't know if this is actually doing anything what what time zone are you in? I'm in I'm in California. Okay. So it's still it's still daylight out here. It's the sun's getting down there, but it's still it's still daylight. It's got another hour before it sets, I think, or maybe yeah. a little well, bit I'm, less than that. I'm in Moreno Valley out by Riverside. Oh, okay. Yeah. But this has been going. I've been seeing this. Uh, I was going to try to use this as a uh, as a little test to be able to, you know, do some periodic error because I could actually turn the encoders off 
you know, with, with uh, APCC. This is another software application that I wrote. This is for astrophysics, and you could turn the encoder off, and then you'd be able to at that point. Well, it actually was off there. So um, <laughs> now it's on now. <laughs> And it's, I, been sitting, it's been sitting there guiding for, or it's been sitting there for like an hour and something. Yeah, it does, yeah it's going to go back and forth through periodic air, but it's not going to, the tracking rate is still going to be about about correct. If there's anything else that happens like periodic air or if there's, um, um, you know, like, like birds in the gears or something like that, it would, you know, wobble back and forth. But the tracking rate um, is, is um uh, is still going. It's it's adjusting the tracking rate to match it. So, in the track, it's telling me it's about um, RA is only about point well, six point seven arc seconds per hour. That's how much uh, drift there is. And deck has a lot more. I think I need to redo my polar alignment or something. Cool. So, that's a lot. Five hundred three arc seconds per hour. But it's it's holding pretty steady. It has not gone off this small chip. It's a six forty by four eighty sensor. And so, um, but it, uh, it's kind of interesting. I've done this before. Um, you can, if you get just the right conditions, it usually is better in winter because the sun is not as high up, but um, you know, it's the middle of summer. It's almost as high as the sun can get. And so it's kind of hard to, to track a star at that point, but you could do it and you could probably get some data from that. Although I, who knows what kind of uh, seeing conditions there are. It could be bad in the middle of the day. Cool. Anyway. Hey, uh, I have a, qu a question from uh, YouTube here. Um, the the videos that you shared, the how to do is that? Do you have how to videos published anywhere? I have not published those, but I will publish them. And there's actually a few other ones which I I didn't finish. Um, that actually go through all the whole steps of uh, from the beginning to the end um, in, a, in a quick manner. I try to cut them down as short as possible whenever there was like an image being taken or something was taken a long time. I compress it down and with a video editor so it goes real fast so that uh, people aren't getting bored watching them. So uh, where, um, where can we get the PEM Pro Log Viewer? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a, let me find the link. It's on the CCD Wear site. Uh, there's, but there's actually a better way to get that. Um, oh, in the in the PEMPRO help file. Okay, there's a, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's not what I was thinking of. That's the wrong thing. I, I How about if I take a quick look here? Hold on a second here. Take your time. Any Is other there questions? Also a, uh, a trial period for PEMPRO? There's 60 days you can try it for. 60 days but you know just make you know make sure that you try with your camera and it works for you you can the only limitation on this is that is it only lets you collect for 30 minutes of data and um that should be more than enough to, to let you know whether or not your equipment works okay or not so um this might be the easiest way to do it glenn points out that he found the link to pem to pem pro log viewer on cloudy nights i think that's what Glenn is. here is here it is right here actually I open it up it is um if you guys can see it if you can, post it, if you can post it on the uh, group chat in in the room i'll post it on the bottom of the video okay okay now we do have a question from chow um ray when i'm trying to use pem pro for my los monday g11 gemini 2 which one should I select for the profile setting? Gemini level four five or Losmondi G11 Gemini? Which, well, it depends on which controller you have. If it's, um, the G11s come without the Gemini controller. If you have the Gemini um, level four or Gemini two, which is the another name for the gem, uh, level five, then you wanna do the level, uh, Gemini level four slash five option or level four slash two. But if you don't have the Gemini controller then, and you just have the, the basic controller for it, then you want to specify G11 for it, the, the mount type. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, I missed a, I missed a question from earlier about a paramount. Oh, what? Oh, here we uh, go. The question is, can I open data generated on a previous night and uh, just sync the worm phase, then create the curve and apply it. 
if you if you collected it with PEMPRO, you already it already is in phase um, uh, in, the, in the proper phase. All you need to do is create a curve. You can create it any time later than that, and then uh, upload it to the mount. It's already in phase, unless you do something that changes the phase, like somehow like get into the internals and change the gears or something like that. You know, like the dis disengage the gears in some way from the PEC mechanism. You know, but in most cases, yes, you can you can build it any time you want afterwards. And for those using portable mounts, this doesn't really change from taking it down, putting it in your garage, putting it back in the truck, and taking it out to your campsite. No, once no. it's loaded into the mount, it's it's fine. It might it may change um, over time. Like every if you use your mount, like say every weekend or every, you know like for like I don't know five six hours, say you know imaging or whatever, then I would check it at least every three to six months or so because it might change by that time because the gears do wear in. And, and if, especially if you're changing the, the weight of your equipment that you're, you know, like from one type of telescope to another type, it could be that it might happen faster. So, um, because a lot of the gears are not really super hard materials and they, they do, you know, tend to to wear in and they actually get smoother in most cases, you know, the, the, the period here. Okay. Where are we? Where are you going, Which, Ray? That's your screen with the Google on it. Yeah, I was trying to. I was trying to think of where, where to find the uh, Pempro Log Viewer. Um, we can we can add that later if you'd like to find it. Uh, right, Togo? We can we can add. Yeah, it I can I can always add it to the bottom of the YouTube video. Okay, so if you, okay. If you could, Ray, just uh, send it by email back to us later. We don't need to take your time for doing that now. Did you have anything else you wanted to show us tonight, Ray? None. No. I, not okay. unless anybody else wants to see something. Uh, well, let's see if we've got any other questions. How are you doing over on the YouTube comments, uh, Olga? Um, there, there are a lot of the, there's conversations going on, but I'm not sure if there's a direct question. Okay. I, I don't, I don't see a direct question. If you guys have a direct question, and if I missed it, could you please type it, type it again, and then before the end of the show, I'll try to get it in. And same thing um, over on Rumble Talk. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we have to choose between Rumble Talk and uh, YouTube because it does cause some confusions. I'm starting to lose my hair over all this. Where do we go for support if needed? Uh, Linda wants to know on Pem Pro. Um, it when you run Pem Pro, there in the help file there, or actually in the help menu, you can go right to the support form, and it's on right here. Uh, except for I'm not signed in. <laughs> uh, you have to sign in to be able to do that. Let me do that from a uh, different computer. And I'll show you. But that's that's really what you want to do. You want to be able to use from PEMPRO itself. You can go into the, um, to the forums there. But you do have to create an account to do it. And let's see. It's... it's done through a third party service is not something that CCD Wear does. Okay. Um, uh, Chow, I think, uh, um, Oops. No, Glenn found a link to um, PEMPRO log viewer. Okay. And I have posted it from Rumble Talk. For those of you in Rumble Talk, you can find it right now. For those of you not in Rumbo Talk, uh, and uh, both Chow and Glenn have posted different links for that. Um, I'm so confused. Uh, Tolga, if you could take that somehow and get it into uh, your um, YouTube comments, please. Uh, where, where is where is is it at Rumble Talk? Uh, it's on Rumble Talk, but I also just I got it. I got it. Okay, I'll I'll put it in there. Okay. Okay, so I did find the place where you where all the updates and that are are shown, and I'm going to put it right here. Hopefully, wait. Wrong. There's a question about polar alignment feature about Pem in Pempro. Yes. Um, could you, uh, uh, you know, elaborate on that a little bit? How does it compare to other software and other methods? Um, the question is asking specifically comparing it to a one software, but we don't want to do that. Just can we just talk about it in general? Um, it is 
the, the main difference, I think that PEMPRO's version of um, the electronic drift correction versus in terms of accuracy is that the PEMPRO also takes into account refraction. So that what you're what it's trying to do is find the true um, the true uh, polar alignment for the telescope rather than the refracted um, um, alignment, which is what you would get if you don't account for refraction. So what this means, though, is that even though there are places where drift might be a little higher because of refraction, what happens is that um, that field rotation, when you go from one part of the sky to another part of the sky, even flipping this telescope from one part of the sky is minimized by doing that which is really what true polar alignment is, is trying to do. You want to not only just remove the drift, but also you want to remove the, the amount of um, a field rotation that happens. Because if you're taking images on something that for hours and hours and hours, and there's ever so slight amount of, uh, of rotation that goes on in the images, then what happens is that you have to, to clip out edges of it. And there's a little bit of blurriness maybe in the edges. It's, you know, it's, you know, compared to the center of it where there's not as much, well, it actually, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it, it the idea is that to reduce the amount of uh, field rotation, it is not very much difference, but there is a difference, you know, between that and other um, other solutions. Another thing about PEMPRO is that it's designed to be easy to use. When you like, when you say you go and you adjust your mount, and there may be other. I haven't looked at how the other programs work, but when you adjust the mount, it will automatically find another star for you because whatever star it was looking at, it's going to be lost when you adjust the mount. And then you just go over and you look and you you see, and it actually shows you which direction, how many arc minutes to go to 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 adjust. And like I said, if you have that azimuth in, um, adjuster and you know exactly how many ticks it takes to move, you can get you can get dialed in very quickly into you know to the polar alignment. I'm 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 down to like you know 20 minutes or so. And it just doesn't take me that long to to you know to you know get the polar alignment, and I think that I know there are other solutions, but you you may need to have uh, visibility of the uh, of the of um, the north celestial pole or south celestial pole, depending on where you're at. Maybe some people don't have that ability, um, you know, to to view there. But any of the mechanisms are are probably good enough, you know, and and so I, you know. Um, is uh, the most recent version, George wants to know, George Lutch wants to know, 1.4.0.0? Of the Pemper Log Viewer? No. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, um, no, wait. What is that? Four, one point, no, that's not it. No. Okay. Oh, okay. If you click that link there, oh, it doesn't work on this computer. Darn it. Sorry. Uh, let me go back over here. Uh, we, we can always find out by going like up to help. Uh, yeah, up okay, here. here's here's always the latest link to it. Oh, copy link. That that is a link to the page where it it, it talks about the various um, changes that have been made. But if you go here, this will be. If I get back to that page, this should be the link to download. The latest. Oh, it messed up the link there. That should say, hold on one second. Let me check it here. See, when I copied the link, it uh, it didn't do the whole thing. Okay. So let me fix but, it. But within the link, within the viewer, if we open the viewer, can we tell, is there some place to check update or check for updates? Yes, when you get the, when you finally get the the application, yes, there is, and it's my fault that I've not been very good at um, maintaining a web page. Um, Pen Pro Live Viewer. Uh, let's see. I this, this think we have one one point or another. I think we've gotten through all the questions, and we're probably getting towards wind up time here, guys. So if you've got anything more, get them in here. Uh, Terry's got one. Terry's in the room. Uh, That's yeah. It. Ask your question. Unmute and ask your question, Terry. Yes, pin, binning can be used while polar aligning. If that's you, Terry. And he has a slow camera. Now, now, when doing polar aligning, even if you have a slow camera, it's going to do a, a. It's going to find a star. It's going to do full frame. Then it's going to pick out a star in the range that you select. So, like in some cameras, you don't want to have a saturated star. So you can set, you know, like say that the saturated star is in a thirty thousand. 
on it. Well, if you have a, if you have a webcam, it might be much much lower, like 128 or something or 200. But it'll find a star there. Then it does a subframe, a real small subframe, like 20 by, I mean, by, by 32 by 32 or 64 by 64. I think you can select the size on that. So I know for for PC you can too. So. Okay. Um, when you're uh, working with this, Ray wants to know if you recommend locking the uh, Schmidt cast mirrors to avoid tracking errors. Yes, you can. Okay. So yes, you do, if you see my screen here still, you can get the, the number of uh, your tracking rec for, um, for Polar Alignment Wizard. So it'll be much faster than downloading the whole image unless it's a DSLR. If you have a DSLR, then it probably won't make any difference. But that's usually not a slow camera, though. It's usually pretty fast. But it's a lot of pixels, and it's just going to download the whole image anyway and just take a fraction of it. So, Ray, that last link that you posted on the um, chat in the Google Room, um, right. the, the folks don't have access to that. So I pasted it into Rumble Talk, and I'm oh. sure. Uh, 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 Tolga is going to post it into YouTube, but what is that a link to? Right, right. That's to the PemPro Log Viewer, the latest okay. version. Always, whenever I get to put a new version there, I will um, put a, a copy of it in that with that same name there, so you can always make sure you get to it. But once you have the application, if there's an update, you could do the check for updates. If it'll give you a direct link to it, you won't need to use this. This is only for people the very first time that are looking for the application. If I gave you a version that had a specific link in it, it might be good for another few weeks until I give you a new version. This one will always have the latest version in it. Um, and so that you can always click, and once you download it, the user can download it as they, if they check for updates, they'll be able to get new versions without having to go back to this link. Okay. Ray wants to know um, uh, that you should, It's in, when using PEMPRO, it says to run it for 60 minutes. Um, is that ideal? Is that minimum? Is that what? Um, yeah. Should he record more? No, it's, um, if you go too many cycles, then actually it becomes very hard to uh, manage the, the drift in it to get a good value for it. You, it's uh, usually not necessarily 60 minutes, but five to six worm cycles is usually good enough. It's a good sweet spot. You don't need to go any more than that. So if your worm, um, if your worm is an eight minute worm, that means probably about, you know, six, 36 minutes or so. If it's a four minute worm, it means 24 minutes. If it's a, you know, something longer, 10 minutes, it would be 60 minutes in that case. Thank you. There's another question. I just, uh, astronomy, I just found your question. I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, in PEMPRO scope mount tab, there's an advanced setting called pulse modul modulo. What is yep. this and how do I determine value? Okay. Now this is, this goes back to the old school days. Um, remember I said earlier that sometimes when you, um, you, you give them out like an 86 millisecond pulse. It doesn't actually move the equivalent of 86 milliseconds at whatever guide rate. That's because a lot of these mounts have like um, a certain size, minimum size, or, or like a, um, you know, like there's like certain quantized values of pulse um, uh, duration that, that, are, that work. So if you tried it to tell a mount to go one millisecond and move, and you did it a thousand times, it's not going to give you the equivalent of a thousand millisecond of a single thousand millisecond move. In fact, it may not even move at all in a lot of cases. It may not move even one bit because one millisecond is so short that most mounts won't do that. So what this th that value is there is for you to be able to set whenever there's a playback. This only applies for mounts that do playback periodic error correction. If you have a mount that you can directly upload, like an AP mount, Gemini, a Paramount, whatever, you don't need to care about that value. It doesn't matter. Um, but if you have a mount that does not have a um, ability to, to directly upload, like say an Ioptron, this may be something you want to have. You might want to set. And each mount is different. How you do it, though, and if you look at PEMPRO, if you could still see it here, there's a thing called pulse test page. If you click that there, what's going to happen is, and you go back to PC, it creates, it opens up a new pulse test page here. And here's what you can do. You can, what, you can actually 
tell the mount or give the mount X number of pulses. And this is in seconds here. And you can tell it to go like 500 moves and in, in of this size, of whatever size it is, pulse duration in milliseconds, and then 500 back and see if it actually moves that distance. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a trial and error for every mount. Not, not every mount is specifically, but every mount type. So like some mounts, I found that most mounts actually like about 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is pretty good. There's also something to do with windows too, windows timing. If you try to do too short of a timing, like less than 18.67 seconds, that there's it's a magic number in some of the older versions of windows. It may not apply anymore. I think it's now um, down to a millisecond, but in some cases, you could not do anything less than that. So 20 milliseconds was the number you really wanted to use. And it was pretty close. So you have to kind of experiment by doing using this thing here. You use the pulse test tab, um, tab and you tell the mount to do 100 moves in one direction. And you can calculate if it's guide rate of one, how far it should have moved. There's a little bit of math involved, but it's not hard. It's just arithmetic. If it really moved that much, if you're looking at the RA, then you know that that's a good value to use. And then you can maybe use even smaller value. The, it's better to have smaller values, but you can't go too small because the mount may not recognize it. So that's what it's there for. And it's only for those mounts that, that require playback. So they don't have a direct upload. It doesn't apply to mounts that do direct upload. So in the hand controller, you put the mount in the record mode. Right. 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 And then you start playing. Pempro plays the playback, right. correction to the mount, right? That's right. And so what it's doing is it's giving those mo those moves and pulses of that size, quantized to those size. So if you give it a value of, say, 40 is your pulse modulo, it'll Pemper will, will just save up values until it says, that oh, 40 milliseconds. I'm going to move exactly 40 milliseconds, and it's going to know what residuals was left over. So say there was it should have moved 46 milliseconds. It'll say, okay, 40 seconds, and it knows I, I have six left over. Carry that six. Then the next time something goes, um, some move happens that causes it to move 40 milliseconds one way or another, it will, it'll, it'll, um, it'll use that value and carry the residual. It does multiples too of it. So it could be 40, 80, 120, whatever. If there's, if it needs to do it, it'll do that, but it only will do it in those increments of that, of that size. And if you don't do that, then the periodic error curves usually don't work very well because the mount can't see some of the pulses. You tell it to go, you know, 27 milliseconds, it, it, it may do only 18 and it's totally wrong then. It doesn't get recorded right. So that's why it's needed. Okay. Oh, you okay, Toga? Uh, just, just one last question uh, is uh, about those videos. Uh, the how-to videos. Are you going to post those, or when are you going to post those? Where are you going to post them? Um, I, I have a channel for serious imaging on uh, on YouTube. That's where I'll post them, and I'll give you guys the link, and then you can attach it to this uh, this um, presentation. Yeah, that would be great. Ray wants to know if he needs to worry about changing your guide rates if if he's recording periodic error correction. Is there an ideal guide rate for every mount? That is, if it's if it's moving more aggressively, does he need to reduce the guide rates uh, on the hand control? It depends. Every mount is different. For instance, the Gemini's have a very unusual scheme for periodic error correction, where their values are are different in east versus west, and there it also depends on the guide rate because it uses the guide rate as as um, the the movement um, segments. So it has a lot of little segments there, but they're all based on time. So, but the direction, the, the amount of move that happens in the east is different from the amount that happens in the west because it's it's relative to scenario. If you have a you have a point uh, five guide rate, for instance, it goes one point five guide rate, but the time, the amount of movement at one point five is higher than it is at point six. There's less, less I mean, than, than point five, which is one minus point five. So you have that. There's a, it's a nonlinear relationship, and so it depends. Other mounts though use distance like astrophysics mounts and i think paramounts and uh, a few other mount types they use um, delta values in, in distance so those are all the same it doesn't matter if you have whatever guide rate you want to use um, but of course you can upload those but the earlier controllers you couldn't so um, but there is always a minimum the minimum is what is the minimum unit that 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 motor or whatever can move um, 
So if it's a stepper motor, there's some little, there's one little, you know, click of the motor and that's the minimum. It might be, you know, point, uh, 0.2 arc seconds. I think for some mounts, uh, it's point, I think for astrophysics, I think it's 0 0.05 arc seconds. Some other mounts might be more or less than that. So that's the minimum that you could actually move. And so if you calculate guide rate and, and the number of milliseconds or whatever, there is some minimum value which makes sense. And un, you know anything other uh, less than that won't actually do anything. OK, I think I've gotten everybody out of Rumble Talk. And I think I got everybody from YouTube. And I think, Ray, you got anything else you need to tell us? Um, I hope you guys got something from this. Uh, it was kind of fun to talk about this for once. I don't get to do this very often. So, um, hey, you got to come back and tell us about some of your other programs and maybe hook us up with some of the other CCD wear people because I know you guys got a whole stable full of programs that are quite useful for somebody who wants to figure out what their equipment can do, how it can do it, how to improve it, and everything else like that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk to John Smith. Um, He's in touch with the other authors, and uh, you know it's um, we're, we're, each of the authors is independent from each other. I, I can't promise you anything, but uh, yeah. you know it's uh, better if they want to do it, you know. And so, um, and it sure yeah, is easy to do. <laughs> I would love a presentation separate one just for APCC if that's possible. Oh, that's absolutely possible. Yeah. Cool. I got to so, buy that or not someday. Any rate. Okay, we're getting close to wrapping up. I want to remind everybody that we do have an um, we do have an um, we do have a workshop going on for July fourteenth, which means that we need you processed with anything that you're going to process on on Terry's data, and try to get it into us by um, by July seventh, uh, or even before, so we can start inviting you into the room and stuff like that. Um, I think that's it for the night. So, um, Ray, hang around after we sign off here, but I'm going to say good night to everybody. So, uh, good night. Bye bye.